Berjaya Corp CEO and shareholder Jalil Abdul Rashid has been appointed the deputy chairman of the group's listed subsidiary Red Tone Digital. In a boss filing, Red Tone announced that Jalil has been appointed to its board as its non-independent and non-executive deputy chairman effective today. According to Red Tone's FY20 annual report, Berjaya Corp owns a 52.38% stake in the ACE-listed telco service provider, while Johor ruler Sultan Ibrahim Ibni Almarhum Sultan Iskandar owns a 17.34% stake. Jalil was appointed as Berjaya Corp's CEO on March 16th and has been mandated to transform the group into a high-performing organisation. This would entail the streamlining of various group businesses to create an enhanced shareholder value, optimising financial and human resources, improving synergies and efficiency, as well as enhancing corporate governance and transparency. Rajaya Corp founder and now non-executive chairman Tan Sri Vincent Tan had reportedly said the group will be undergoing a period of change to ensure it is future-proofed against external shocks. He also said the group is undergoing a period of consolidation to sweat our assets better. Dato Sri Najib Razak's lawyer Tanya Shivetti says, The prosecution's asset forfeiture action against the former Prime Minister must be dismissed because there is no evidence that the seized items from his residence along Jalan Langa Duta were bought with the alleged 1MDB-linked money in his Ambank accounts. Shivetti told High Court Judge Mohamed Zaini Mazlan today that the prosecution had failed to prove how the funds that were sent to Najib's Ambank accounts are linked to the handbags, watches and foreign currencies seized from Najib's residence during a raid in 2018. She argued that there is no evidence at all that the seized properties were proceeds of unlawful activity. Chivetti also said there were material gaps in the alleged 1MDB money trail as there is no documentary evidence such as bank statements from 1MDB, Goodstar, 1MDB Energy, ABBA BVI and other entities to show that the money that ended up in Najib's Ambank accounts did come from 1MDB. Based on the prosecution's submissions, Shivati said the asset forfeiture action against Najib must be dismissed. Air Asia has expanded its Air Asia Super app to provide financial products and services under the Air Asia Money banner, beginning with a partnership with financial comparison platform Ringgit Plus. Through its partnership with the platform, AirAsia Money currently provides credit card and loan application services. The financial marketplace will also enable users to obtain the best personal finance news, information and guidance and make the best choices for their immediate needs. According to AirAsia CEO Tan Sri Tony Fernandez, the launch of AirAsia Money marks the final piece of the puzzle for the AirAsia Super App, a concept that was aggressively pushed since October 2020. It is the third vertical after travel and e-commerce. Head of Air Asia Money Mohammad Hafiz Mohammad Fazil said the platform which targets millennials will soon also include an array of other financial products for insurance, investments, top-ups, gaming credits, as well as other services including remittance and zakat payments. Meanwhile, Ringgit Plus co-founder and CEO Siu Yuan Tak said this was an opportunity to bring the two brands together to democratize the finance industry by offering banking and insurance products that anyone could apply for. Air Asia Money is set to launch in Singapore in the second quarter of 2021, the Philippines in the third quarter and Thailand in the last quarter of the year. Maxa says first quarter FY21 net profit slipped 6.4% to 334 million ringgit. No thanks to lower revenue. Top line was down by 4.8% to 2.23 billion ringgit. Earnings per share fell to 4.3 sen from 4.6 sen. The group declared a first interim single tier tax exempt dividend of 4 sen per share for FY21. Maxis noted in a filing to the Bourse that its service revenue shrank by 10 million ringgit or 0.5% to 1.96 billion ringgit. This was largely due to lower revenue from international direct dialing and a temporary lack of international roaming income. 
though it was offset by growth in its enterprise and fiber businesses. Average revenue per user was lower almost across the board, save for the wireless broadband segment. Notably, demand for data increased across its customer base, with average per month data usage up by 24% for prepaid and 36.5% for postpaid. On a quarter-on-quarter -on -quarter basis, net profit rose 4.7% despite a 1.5% decrease in revenue. Looking ahead, Maxis said it remains confident in its convergence strategy, though it notes that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to raise concern. Digi.com posted a 20% slump in first quarter FY21 earnings to 264.83 million ringgit as it took a hit from mark-to-market -market adjustments on interest rate swaps. Quarterly revenue slipped 0.64% to 1.55 billion ringgit due to lower non-internet contribution. Earnings per share fell to 3.41 cent from 4.27 cent a year ago. The group declared an interim dividend of 3.4 cent. Digi said it had registered 22 million ringgit fair value loss on higher projected forward-looking interest rates. This was in contrast with a fair value gain of 37 million ringgit recorded in the same period last year when the projected interest rates decreased substantially at the onset of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, non-internet contribution fell by 19.8%, but that was cushioned by digital revenue growth of 77.8%. Service revenue declined by 3.6%, as roaming fell 56.6%. The G's chief executive officer, Albamorti, says the group saw a steady growth year-on-year -year from improved commercial momentum leveraging internet growth and a stronger network that has provided better capacity and consistent network experience. The telco reaffirmed its FY21 guidance of low single-digit decline for service revenue, medium single-digit decline for EBITDA, and capital expenditure to total revenue ratio of 14 to 15 percent.